life isn't always easy. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have roadblocks. Some days where things don't go your way, you might have some weeks or months where things don't go your way. Mental health is very, very important. You can't help yourself. It's very, very difficult to help other people. For usual, you crushed it. Good job. It's been a minute, but welcome everyone to Sip and Soju podcast. We have a long-awaited guest here, Dr. Alan Mao, uh, my older brother. Uh, without further ado, uh, Alan, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, bro. Absolutely. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you as well. Um, I know you took vacation time off for this week just to visit Madison, Wisconsin. So, um, per usual, always a good time having you here. And yeah, I guess for folks who may not be familiar with who you are, do you mind giving a quick introduction as to you know who Alan is and what you're doing today? Sure. Yeah, so for y'all who don't know me, I'm Max's older brother. Uh, I grew up in Florence, Alabama, and I did my undergraduate at UAB in Birmingham, Alabama. And then I went on to do medical school right after that in Mobile, Alabama. So I was four years at medical school. And then I'm currently doing radiology residency at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. And that's a five-year program. And for those of you who don't know what radiology is, basically... It's the field of medicine where we use imaging to diagnose and treat diseases. So that could be things such as reading x-rays, reading CTs, reading MRIs, but we also do image-guided procedures as well, which are minimally invasive. For those who may not be familiar with your medical journey, do you mind providing a little more insight as to what first got you interested in medicine and why you chose that career path? So I was always interested in science growing up, you know, such as like chemistry and physics, but I guess what drew me to medicine was my desire to help people. And I have a personal story to share. Just, you know, Max also has experienced the same thing. But when I was a senior in high school, my dad was diagnosed with liver cancer. And that was pretty tough on our family. Um, and then during my first year of uh, undergraduate at UAB, he passed away from liver cancer. And during that time, you know, I was not always around to help him as, as a caretaker. So that kind of struck me pretty deeply. And so... Uh, from that point on, I made a journey to kind of, you know, try to become a doctor. Uh, one of my dad's uh, dream goals was to become a doctor. And so I'm sure if he was here today, you know, he'd be, he'd be very proud of where I am right now. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I know he's definitely really proud of you. Similar to the, the, the same life story that we both shared, like I can totally see the ambition for why you wanted to pursue a career in medicine. Ultimately, medicine is one of those really long journeys, right? You have schooling for a ridiculous amount of years, and just because you have the motivation to do it doesn't mean that you'll necessarily like it. One thing that we've talked about earlier this week is you've uh, informed me that you've thoroughly enjoyed you know, radiology, which you're currently doing now, and you've enjoyed the process. I guess, what has made the process enjoyable for you? Because I know for a lot of other people who might have the ambition of pursuing medicine, they you know, they get burnt out, they, they feel these roadblocks and they're not able to push past those. What has worked for you and, and how have you navigated through that? Yeah, that's true that you mentioned that. You know, medicine in general is not an easy journey. So basically, like I mentioned before, I did four years of undergraduate, followed by immediately by four years of medical school. And then for radiology, it's a five-year program, plus probably one additional year of fellowship. So that'll be in total 14 years of education, Crazy. which is a long time consecutively. Um, I guess one of the things that you need to make sure you have in your lifestyle is, is a good work-life balance. So in radiology, I'm very, very happy with the, the work-life balance I have. And also, it's good to have a very, you know, strong cohort in your class. And so, you know, I love all my classmates. We're all best friends. And also, everyone else in the program is super, super nice and very, very supportive. And the faculty are very, very supportive as well. And so, ultimately, I'm very, very happy where I am right now. And I know that I've just begun because uh, I'm a second year resident right now. So I did one year internship, plus I'm in my first year of radiology right now. So I'm still very, very early in this process. But I can tell right now that this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I ultimately went through with. That's awesome. I, I know you're happy. We talked about this earlier uh, before we filmed the podcast. And going off of that, then, I'm very curious what your take is because you're, you're obviously a more experienced resident now. You've gone through the entire med school. You've gone through the entire, you know, choosing a specialty, all that stuff. Do you have any, like, insight as to what could make medical school and just, like, the choosing of a specialty 
just like better for future applicants? Like what could change in the system? Because like from my understanding, obviously applying to medical school is a brutal process, right? It's very highly selective, dependent on standardized scores, dependent on, you know, your personal experience as well. And oftentimes these numerical metrics that show that you do well in school, that show you know how to study, they don't exactly one-to-one -one correlate to you becoming a successful doctor or, you know, having that drive and passion for caring for patients. In that avenue, like, do you have any recommendations on how, like, the system could change to be, to be just better for folks who may not be as good of a test taker but really do have the drive and passion and want to become a doctor? That sounds like a good question right there. Um, yeah, so medical school, I guess when I applied, it really is dependent on two you know, major scores, like your step one, step two score. Essentially, you have one chance to take this test, and not only do you have to pass it, you have to score really, really high if you want to get a competitive specialty. And so now they've actually done away with step one being just pass-fail now. And so they're trying to look into a more, more holistic approach. They, you know, they want to look at your volunteering experience, your research, you know, your extracurricular activities. So I feel like in that regard, you know, they're trying to look more than just one score, you know, because one score... It's tough, you know. I've had friends who wanted to do a competitive specialty, but they didn't do very well in step one. They passed, but you can't just retake the test again. And unfortunately, they did not match into those competitive specialties. And so I feel like with that being pass-fail now, it should give people a better chance, at least, you know, because apparently people looking at your applications, they can't see your actual scores, just pass-fail. I see. And so, and also, I guess, I guess it depends on the time of the year as well. So I know right now radiology is pretty competitive just because a lot of people are seeing what a great specialty it is. Um, during the time of COVID, you know, so, some specialties, you know, didn't do so well. Like, for example, emergency department, ED, a lot of people were very burnt out by COVID. They saw how, you know, tough those hours were and also being in the front line exposed to, you know, COVID itself. And so ED has really taken a hit over the past couple of years. And also primary care as well. It's like internal medicine, family medicine, those specialties apparently are also declining right now. And so I, I guess they're just, you know, trends and fluctuations in medicine. But I think that, you know, again, with step one being past fail now, it should, it should provide for more people to be able to, you know, expand their horizons and feel more safe applying to different specialties. I, I truly hope that's the case. And yeah, not only at the med school level where you said the standardized test, like step one, step, step one's being pass fail. Also, I know at some universities, like even ACT, SAT, for a period of time, those would were pass fail or those were optional for college students as well. I think I do enjoy the fact that the admissions board is looking at a more holistic view of the application, but I, I also can see the flip side of that potentially even making the decisions even more difficult because without you know quantifiable metrics, without a good balance, you know, like it's very difficult to say, you know, which student has more experience, which student has more drive. Um, and I think there's needs to be more research based on, you know, the numbers in addition to, you know, the personality, the interview, stuff like that. Um, one thing you mentioned during uh, your uh, response was during the pandemic, the COVID period of time. I know you were like a first line responder. You, you helped out in some of the, the, the clinics and stuff like that. Do you mind uh, just sharing, like, how was your experience there, like, just being there in person and seeing it, you know, during the peak pandemic? Yeah, so when COVID first started, I was, I was in the second half of my third year of medical school. And so, you know, I guess because COVID was so new, the doctors didn't really know what was going on. So we were actually pulled from our clinical rotations. And so during third year, <clears throat> typically you have like your clerkships where you have different rotations. You know, you go there, you do surgery, you do OBGYN. We were actually pulled from those rotations. We had to do virtual learning at home. Right. And that also, you know, COVID was, you know, it's been a two, two, three year long journey. And so during the fourth year of medical school, when I was interviewing for residency programs, typically you go in person for interviews. That was also changed. We did virtual interviews for the first time. And so when I actually matched at Gainesville, Florida for radiology, I'd never even been to, been to Gainesville before. So... Um, there's that. And then going forth, uh, my internship I did at a hospital in Gainesville, Florida, a transitional year. Um, you know, I was, I was a first line responder. COVID was still pretty, pretty difficult and still pretty deadly then as well. And so my first rotation at uh, the hospital was that was actually an ICU. And so I saw frontline people I talked to, you know, die from COVID. It was right. a very, very tough process, you know, because you want to be there to help. But a lot of times, you know, no matter what, no matter what, you know, how hard you try or what you do, you know, 
that, that's just the nature of the disease. Yeah, fortunately now with the vaccinations, and it looks like COVID has kind of has been declining. You know, you don't really hear hear of it as much right now, but right. It's, it's still out there though. Yeah, that's I, I can't imagine being on the front line in like peak 2020, 2021. Um, again, like really appreciate your service and for what you you've done there. And obviously, it's difficult, especially when you're doing something that's not really part of the specialty that you were trained to do. You know, so um, huge kudos to you there. Very curious if we switch gears. For folks who don't know, you know, who you are or what you like to do, they now know your profession. They now know your journey. I guess outside of medicine, who is Alan? What does Alan like to do? That's a good question. Who is Alan? <laughs> <clears throat> so in my free time, I love sports. So my, my favorite two sports to play are soccer and then I watch basketball. So growing up with Max, we used to play soccer all the time, you know, for YMCA, play for middle school <laughs> as well. So I love watching soccer, I love watching basketball and football as well, and then I also love playing guitar. So I was, I grew up playing acoustic guitar when I was like 13 years old, and you know, I love covering some of my favorite artists, um, so those include like Smashing Pumpkins, you know, different kinds of alternative and indie, indie music as well, and then I um, also love playing chess. So I play chess online, also play chess in person. Max and I play chess, you know, from time to time. We're probably about 50-50. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. Yeah, neck and neck. And then I also love trying uh, new foods. Um, so every single every single week, my girlfriend and I, who's a dental student at, at the University of Florida, we usually go out a couple of times, try some new foods. But then we also try to make, try our uh, best to cook at home as well, just in different recipes. That's cool, man. Thanks for sharing. Obviously, I already know your hobbies, but um, for those who – aren't familiar with you, um, you get a little more insight to who Alan is. With that being said, you mentioned you have you know a variety of different hobbies, much like a lot of other folks. How are you able to balance all of your different hobbies and interests in addition to your career and the rigorous studies that come with that? I feel like that's a huge question that you know folks always have a hard time with. How have you found that to be? So I'm actually still working on that. So in order to you know, have a life outside of work, you need to have good work-life balance. And with radiology, even though sometimes the hours are good, we do have to study a lot at home because, you know, with radiology, you need to know what every single disease looks like on every single imaging modality. And so typically, you know, you might study like, you know, at least one or two hours a day, you know, outside of, outside of work at home. And on weekends, maybe a little bit longer as well. But it is important to, you know, find time to do those hobbies, you know, to spend time with loved ones as well. And also to have, you know, good sleeping habits. And so, you know, like I said before, like I'm still working on, you know, balancing all that because I'm not the best at it, to be honest. But um, it is possible with time management. And so I feel like right now the thing I struggle most with is getting enough sleep. But I've kind of been doing that my whole life, so. The sleep part is something I, I know, like, we've we've talked about a lot. It's like the one free thing that everyone can do that can help recharge your battery. Um, something that I hope folks who are, you know, making laws or doing the regulations, at least in the medical field, I hope they start to prioritize and, and just make, you know, the work that a physician does and what regardless of the specialty, just more balanced so that that can be more attainable. And then looking back as well, it's like, you know, even one hour of sleep means a lot. So. Right. Like, how much more are you going to get out of studying for one hour when you're running on fumes? You know, you might as well just call it quits, you know, have a good night rest and then start, you know, start fresh the next day. But I still struggle with doing that. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Same here sometimes. Changing gears just a little bit. We've talked about your profession. We've talked about your hobbies. I know that, you know, your main focus, at least for the next three years, is to just become a better resident and to just become the best radiologist that you can possibly be. If we, you know, look further ahead at your aspirations and career goals long term, you know, let's say in five years after you finish residency and you're an attending physician, what is your goal, you know, in five years? What is your goal in 10 years, um, professional and personal, if you don't mind sharing? Professional, obviously, would be, you know, to become the best radiologist I could, I could become. Also, just choose a good, you know specialty. So right now I'm leaning towards neuroradiology, but okay. you know, the doors are still wide open for for everything else. And then, you know, find I find a job that I'm happy with. I'm still deciding right now between academic and private practice. Those are, you know, two different realms. 
And then on a personal level, I would like to get married. Also, you know, get a house and try to find a, a location that, you know, has access to everything. I don't know if it's going to be a big city or a city on the coast, but those are kind of things I'm you know, having in mind right now. For previous podcast guests that I've had, when I've asked them about, you know, their aspirations in five to 10 years, obviously the folks that I've had on the podcast, they've, they've been in different stages of life. So it's, I'm always curious to hear about, you know, what's top of mind for those, those type of things. And uh, you being, I definitely one of the older podcast members that we've had so far, granted you're only 20, yeah, I'm 27 right now. You're only 27 and he's, so Alan's only 27. He's, he's a second year resident. So he's very young for being a physician. Um, with that being said, he's, he's the oldest member of the podcast I think we've had so far. So <laughs> definitely one of the like more mature a, and wise ones. Like a boomer now. A boomer. <laughs> definitely not uh, Gen Z. As part of tradition, we're doing the halftime show. This time we're going to change it up. We're going to call it Hot Takes. So we're going to ask Alan five rapid fire questions and uh, we'll see how you deal under pressure, okay? Let's do it. MCAT or step one? Which one was harder? Definitely MCAT. Because with step one, you at least got into medical school, and so you kind of knew that you had what it takes to be a doctor. MCAT's definitely harder because the stuff they ask you on the test, like random chemistry, physics stuff, like it doesn't matter after you take the test. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty tough test too. Um, after I took the MCAT, I thought I failed it. Whereas after I took step one, I also thought I failed it, but I had a better feeling than MCAT at least. When you don't have work, chilling indoors or being outside? I'll probably say being outside. You know, I, I love going on hikes, even though Gainesville kind of sucks in the fact that, you know, it's flat, there's no mountains at all or anything, but I love being outside, going to the park, with, uh, going on walks with my girlfriend, um, you know, playing sports outside like soccer, basketball. But, you know, I'm also okay if it's raining and being indoors as well. So, Coffee or tea? Definitely coffee. I don't drink that much tea, but coffee kind of keeps me going in the mornings. You know, some days when... I'm lacking sleep, which is almost every single day. Um, it's good to get a little bit, a little caffeine in your system to, to get going. So, summer or fall? I know Gainesville doesn't really have fall like right. seasons, but you know, hypothetically, I would probably say I'd probably say fall. You know, being, you know, Gainesville. If you haven't been to Gainesville before, it's in the middle of Central Florida. It's very, very hot and humid. You know, almost all year round. Like right now, it's springtime, but it's like you know, 85, 90 degrees. Um, in the days where it rains, which sometimes they call it Rainsville because it really <laughs> rains a lot, so it's very humid. Um, yeah, I think fall is just better. Fall, you know, the weather's probably a little, a little more cool. But regardless, if you don't, if you haven't been to Gainesville before, it's basically hot and humid all year round. All right, last question, rapid fire. Cardio or weightlifting? Definitely weightlifting because I just don't do cardio at all. And I probably should. <laughs> Uh, fun fact, actually, my first time running kind of was during COVID because, you know, we couldn't go to the gym, but Max recently invited me on a run yesterday and we did a mile and I was completely gassed <laughs> because that was the first time I ran in like three years. Yeah. But, you know, it's imp it is important to do cardio, but right now I'm part of Crunch Fitness Gang. So Crunch Fitness. I try to do, uh, you know, deadlifts, benching, and squatting, and I do go with some of my uh, co-residents to the gym, so... Crunch Fitness, you heard it first. Please sponsor us on this podcast. And then uh, as a side additional question with that, what is your favorite weightlifting exercise? If you only, if you only name one. Favorite is probably benching. I would say the best I'm at is squatting. So my legs are definitely the strongest part of my body, but I just think benching in general is just, you got bench, man. You got a bench press? Yeah, bench. I feel that. You, know, you got to put on two wheels and then <laughs> got to rip it out. So Got to put on four plates. Exactly. Cool. Well, all right. That concludes the hot take segment of the podcast. Alan, per usual, you crushed it. Um, that was a good depth. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll continue with the second part of the, of the film, then. Okay. Cool. Those were pretty much the main questions that, that I wanted to ask you. Is, is there anyone that you want to give a shout out to? Um, who are the people that are most important to you? Yeah. So, th so there's three people in my life right now who are the most important to me. So one, obviously, is our mom. So... You know, our, our, our dad passed away when we were pretty young. I think I was 18, you were 16. And so in America, only you, me, and my mom live in America. And we're also pretty spread apart right now. You know, you're in Wisconsin. I'm in Florida. My mom's in Alabama. And we don't really get to see each other very often anymore. But we do have a group chat. We do text every single day. 
you know, after work, I'll call my mom, make sure she's doing okay. And then you, of course, you know, we talk every single day. Of course. You're texting, Snapchatting, you know, random pictures of ourselves, which make no sense. Um, and also calling each other on the phone. And so we've definitely maintained a good relationship, you know, throughout, you know, us being brothers. And then also my girlfriend, Diane, who is about to graduate and become a dentist at the University of Florida. And I'm always, you know, so, 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 so proud of her. Um, and she's just, you know, a wonderful human being, always very, very caring. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate to meet her in uh, residency. So we've been dating for about one and a half years now. But I can already tell that you know, this is going to go a lot further than that. Yeah, with that being said, super proud of you, man. And uh, really happy that, you know, you gave credit to the people that are most important to you. So, Diane, if you if you aren't watching this podcast, would highly recommend you to watch it just for the shout out. So, <laughs> I do have two cats that I love. Their names are Hugo and Moshi. And if you follow my Instagram, sometimes I post you know pictures of them. I'll drop their Instagram handles uh, on the screen when I edit the video, so they'll be on there. Um, yeah, I guess last question that I've asked every podcast member previously. So I guess this is kind of like a repetitive theme. What is one piece of advice or just learned lesson throughout life that you've um, acquired that, you know, you'd like to share to everyone else who may have stuck around this long? I'm going to take a little bit of time to think about this. Yeah, I think that would be sometimes, you know, life, life isn't always easy. You're going to have hardships. You're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have some days where things don't go your way. You might have some weeks or months where things don't go your way. You know, you might have unexpected family deaths. You might have troubles at work, troubles in your personal life, but, you know, things, things always work. You have, to, you have to keep on pushing hard and also, you know, find time to you know, talk, talk to your loved ones, you know, making sure that they understand what's going on with you because nowadays, I guess in this day and age, like mental health is very, very important. You know, you see people, you know, die by suicide every day. You see a lot of physicians also struggle with mental health. And so, you know, being a doctor is very rewarding, but it's not, it's not easy at all. And so you want to make sure that your mental health is good. You know, you find time to do your hobbies, you know, against mental health loved ones, because if you can't help yourself, it's very, very difficult to help other people. Thank you for sharing that, man. No, I completely resonate with that. The most important selfish thing that you can do for yourself and everyone else is to make sure that you're okay. When you're okay, you have all the energy and all the power to you know, change the world and to make others better too. So, um, Alan, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for uh, hopping on this podcast. It's been probably over a year since we posted the last episode, and I'm excited to, to release this one. Uh, for the folks that know you and me, they've been wanting you on here for a while, so I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me on here. For sure, man. Yeah, again, thanks for having me on this podcast. And, uh, you know, guys, please subscribe to Sip and Soji Podcast, you know, these, these are real hot takes, you know, this unfiltered podcast, so we tell it how it is. We say it how it is. On that note, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.